welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, today. I know over the last 48 hours, um, the teams have been very, very busy um, coming up with their solutions. So we're very excited um, to hear them. We did have a steep peak with the judges um, yesterday where we went through um, some of the content and the ideas with the team leads. Um, so hopefully guys, you've had time to take on board what the judges um, said, their suggestions, um, and we're looking forward to seeing um, what it is that you've come up with today. So I'm gonna share my screen. And then we can go through. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see my slides okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're going to run through, if it will let me change the slides. Okay. Let's go back. Okay, so just to um, put out a reminder of the challenge themes that we had, um, we looked at African health, um, African crisis response, economic opportunity, education, environment, and urban infrastructure. So we asked teams to choose um, a, a solution within one of these one of these challenge themes. So these will be. Um, the areas that are covered during the presentation today. Just a reminder for the participants of um, the prizes that we have. And firstly, again, I just want to say a huge thank you to our sponsors, um, to Oracle for providing um, the, some of the prizes, the cloud credits, um, and also the platform um, that was made available um, to, the, um, to the participants. Um, to Cisco for um, the training um, that's available this, with the Cisco Network Academy. Um, so a huge thank you for that. And again, this is something that's open to all participants. Um, to um, Oze for the software subscription um, for the business culture in your pocket, which again has been made available to all participants. Um, and last but not least, to Andela, um, a thank you for um, helping us with the cash prizes. So we're very excited to be able to, um, to go through this, and this is only possible um, through our sponsors. Okay, so we're going to get into our presentations. I hope the teams are ready. Um, we have, there's actually five teams, so the tribe is missing from this slide, I've just realised, but the tribe you are um, after farm tech. So we're going to kick off with Pulsar, PDL. We'll then go on to Team Edutech. We'll go on to Packig Exchange, farm tech, and then we'll have the tribe. Um, so um, I will go ahead and drive the slides for you. Please remember that you have seven minutes to present and the judges will have three minutes um, to ask questions. Okay. All right. So if you're ready, I'm going to go ahead. Just let me know when you need me to go on to the next slide. Um, and TJ, if you can help me with the timing. Absolutely. Okay. Pulsopedia, you're up. All right. So um, good morning, good afternoon to everyone, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Prosper Ikerike, and I'm representing Team Pulse of PDL. So um, today, we want to use this opportunity to show you um, what we innovated for the hackathon. Okay, please, next slide. Okay, so why Pulse of PDL? So Pulse of PDL was created to empower people to live an extremely productive and coordinated life so that they can go ahead to make an impact in the world. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the main problem we identify was the loss of human productivity that arises from the absence of digital infrastructures that enhances personal coordination and digital organization. And this problem is prevalent in the Africa's education space. I can't really say globally, but as an African student, it's one problem that 
lecturers, students, and researchers face in the educational space. And that is why when we're coming up with POSA PDL, in as much as um, we intend to scale globally and cater for a larger audience, but one of our first major targets is in the educational space. And that's why we applied for the education for the education team. So next slide, please. Okay, so the potentials for POSA, like I said earlier, the, uh, our, the first version of the POSA PDA, what we are going to present today is targeted towards scholars in Africa. So we're simply building a digital infrastructure that makes it easier for scholars to organize and coordinate their academic resources. Now, a good example of this is that look at POSA PDL or look at us as digital carpenters. Now, I know so many of you have bookshelves in your house. So what we're trying to do is just re, um, replicating a digital version of a bookshelf. Now we've built an infrastructure and it's left to um, our users to the scholars to determine how they want to arrange their books in it. But now, fortunately, we're no longer talking about physical book. The whole world is getting digitalized and literature too is getting digitalized. And we need to start talking about infrastructures for um, academic and literary uh, materials that are in digital. Oh, oh, please, next slide, if you can hear me. All right, so this is an MVP, a video demo of, um, okay, please can I click the uh, video? So it is a video demo of the whole project. The It's actually working. So we used a lot of open source tools and technologies, and we're able to come up with a demo for the whole solution. So you can please listen to it. Okay, um, please, um, uh, can you um, connect the um, audio, your computer audio to the presentation so um, the um, audio of the video can... Okay, uh, you can't hear the audio. Let me just reshare. All right. Let's try that again. Can everyone hear so, that? So uh, right now, I want to group these pictures. I took them during the last. Could everyone hear that? Yes, we can. Yes, we okay. can. Okay, taking it back to the beginning. My name is Prosper, and in this video, I want to show a demo of the working MVP of Pulsar PDL. So uh, right now, I want to group these pictures. I took them during the last of uh, CSE 333 notes, um, lecture, sorry, in school before the pandemic. And so these images have been on my phone for a long period of time. Uh, so rather than they just laying around on my phone, I want to group these images using the Pulsar PDL software. So whenever I want to read on um, research methodologies or CSE 333, I don't have to go around my phone searching for materials related to CSE 333. I just come to Pulsar PDL and all materials for CSE 33 are neatly kept and arranged with the software. And so I have to create a new topic to group the images. I want to group the images by topic writing a research report and all the images are added. Um, so now I can um, leave the POSA app and also leave the Google Photos app. So whenever I want to read on CSE 333, I know that all my materials from files, videos, images, or notes belonging to CSE 333 can be found here in my POSA app. And this was a topic I created earlier, writing a research um, report. It's all to be writing a research report. And these are the images that we, I sent in earlier, images of a class presentation. Um, and so uh, students could also take um, notes and do a bunch of other things with software. Okay, uh, so thank you, that's it.
right, thank you. So um, let's talk about the potentials of Pulsar PDL compared to our competitors. So um, after working on the project, we never had a competitor in mind, but we had to do our research and we found that Dropbox and Google Drive kind of have some similarities with us. But the main distinction was our empathetic approach to the whole problem of digital resource coordination and productivity. So what we literally did was to combine the concept of physical bookshelves. So like most people here have personal libraries or even if you don't have personal libraries, you have a bookshelf where you keep books and you just arrange it. And then we combined that concept with digital materials. And then we added the layer of digital technology to innovate the world's first infrastructure for personal digital library with equal emphasis on full offline and online usages. And really, I believe that this what makes us stand out from um, platforms like Dropbox and the rest was that we approached this whole problem from an empathetic lens because it was actually one that really affects us. And the potentials for the platform or the potentials for personal digital libraries in the future is really endless because every day literature is being digitalized. We're using audio books, videos, um, notes, PDFs, PPT presentation every single day. All these technologies were not available last 30 years and now they are available today. And so we need to start talking about building infrastructures for coordinating these um, digitalized literature if we don't want a situation whereby we eventually get into a chaos. Because if you look at the projection like the next 10 years or 20 years, we would have accumulated so much digital footprint in terms of um, maybe personal images, videos, and it's even like way beyond academic. And so like there's a lot of potentials for uh, personal digital in the personal digital library space. So please, next slide. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, you have one minute left. Okay, so what's next for um, Pulsa PDL? So we're going to continue developing our uh, infrastructure across Android and iOS. And we've already started making plans of extending our infrastructure to desktop with the help of um, Google's desktop um, Compose in collaboration with JetBrains and also extending it to the web. Um, now, Pulsar PDL is also going to build on this cloud infrastructure by working with Oracle Cloud infrastructure, hopefully if we get some of those credits. And lastly, we are obviously going to extend this service beyond academic usage to serve for a wider audience and operate on a larger scale. So um, the first, the reason why our target is education this time is like in these initial stages because the problems more prevalent in the education space and those in the education space, the student lecturers and researchers relate to the problem more than anyone else. Okay, please, next slide. Okay, uh, the team names, we have two extra team members, but they didn't um, submit their names and their expertise on time. So we had to just put this, but hopefully we'll add your names when we get it. And that's all from Team Pulsar PDL. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. We really appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Pulsar. Thank you, Pulsar. Uh, Thank you. Right on time. Excellent. Um, so judges, should we open it up to you? Any questions? Thank you so much, Tim Paul. So this is Lenin. Um, uh, I think that was a great presentation. And, you know, uh, I think you're trying to do something really good in the education sector. Uh, I'm still um, struggling with the differentiation and uh, how this is going to pretty much fit having um, already existing software that does this and uh, is free to a good extent. So I don't know how uh, the Pulse PDL is going to differentiate themselves in terms of, uh, you know, why would I not take my, say, uh, Google Cloud vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Pulse PDL that do the same thing. Uh, but I think uh, from your problem solving skills, it, it's quite clear. Just that differentiation from competition is what I struggle to get. All right, all right. Thank you so much. And I think like we also missed one slide talking about the business model, but um, the business model we're going to be operating on is a freemium business model. So after I set that aside, so let me get down to the question. 
So what really differentiates us, apart from the fact that our project program trying to empathetic lens, but we put a lot of emphasis on organization and coordination. Now, if you look at Google Drive, Google Drive is just like, I would say, an online waste bin or a cloud waste bin, whereby you just drop your videos and everything you don't want to be on your phone. Now, Google didn't invest um, enough of, um, will I say, resources on coordination and or, uh, and coordination. And now, if you also look at Dropbox too, that there's also that distinction, like our emphasis on coordination and organization of the infrastructure is really what sets us apart. And aside that, we're offering full offline usage. Now, if you look at Dropbox in rural areas of Africa, like where I'm from, Dropbox is not really popular, but if you go to the Western world, Dropbox is very popular. And one of the major reasons why Dropbox but didn't go back to the software, did that because it didn't, like they weren't able to do much with, um, the offline, like without being connected to the internet. And that is why with POSA PDL is, um, it offers our users like the ability and power to also coordinate their resources locally on their phone. So it's supposed full offline and online usage. So the like three main things are set on the path. We approach this problem from an empathetic lens. Um, we're really, really passionate about solving this problem. And um, second, we put a lot of emphasis thought process and conceptualization on um, organization and coordination of these digital resources, which all the big players didn't really focus on because maybe obviously they were really eager to just build an online storage. And then the third one is that we offer full offline and online usage. So you can just, the freedom is there for people to just determine whatever they want to just do with it. We just provide them with the infrastructure to help them lead their best life. Thank you. Uh, thanks, yes. Prosper, for that um, presentation and elaboration of what you're doing within the education space. Uh, great initiative, even developing a, a mobile platform to engage with the storage uh, backend. Uh, I think what, the other thing that you probably want to think about is business continuity. So anybody using your, uh, your library or your app is going to be using it for free based on what I have seen. And you're going to be leveraging Oracle Cloud credits. So what happens after the credits are used up? Will you still be hosting people's photos, files, uh, scanned uh, uh, classwork? for free and paying for storage for them, for all the various users. You have to think about business continuity compared to what your competition is offering and even the barriers to entry because for probably them, they have other products that are sustaining them, yeah. Right, Hilda, thank you. So um, please, um, if Omar, I don't know, like if you can just go back to the presentation to where we applied our business model, I think, if that we explain, okay, now this is it. So we're only going to, our business model is a freemium model and we're only going to like charge users that use the um, cloud space. So like same thing with what Google Drive said and initially need and Dropbox. So we're only going to charge users for using the cloud space. But in terms of using our infrastructure for offline usage to um, coordinate their resources locally, which a lot of people um, are, open to the idea, especially here in Africa. In terms of that aspect, we did it completely free because like that's a major aspect of the problem we are solving. And really that's what really differentiates us. Like that's one of the main things that differentiates us. So the offline usage will be completely free, but for us to um, make use of the Oracle cloud infrastructure, obviously when we exhaust the credits, we have to keep paying for more. And so our users that use, um, the, that drops their stuff in the cloud, maybe they want to synchronize it between the phone and the web or desktop. They, after exhausting an initial round, they, then they'll have to buy extra, purchase extra space in the cloud. Um, I really hope that answers the question. Thank you. Okay, so you're, what you mean is for, if, if you're not on the internet and you're using your own phone storage, you can be able to use the app to organize the storage, yeah? But if you back up the photos and the documents on cloud, then that's when the customer starts to pay. Exactly, exactly. Okay, okay. All right, thanks. That's Thank exactly. you for that explanation. Thank you, Gilda. 
Thank you, Prospa. I just want to ask about the technology that you would use to make this happen. All right, doctor, thank you. So um, we are going to use a, a number of technologies. One of them is we're operating on the mobile space. So we are going to make use of Google's um, Android technology and we've decided to be really um, efficient about it. And so we make use of Android technologies to develop our Android apps. We could also still use the same Android technologies to build for desktop. So we're also going to use the same Android technologies to build our infrastructures on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux operating systems. And then for the web, we are going to make use, I really don't know if maybe you're a software engineer, but we're going to make use of React because it increases our rate of productivity and we can actually achieve more in a very short period of time. So we're going to use React for the web. And I, I, the main emphasis we like, like creating infrastructures on web, iOS, and Android. One of the main things we're looking at is how to enable our users synchronize their digital um, footprint across the various uh, mobile or desktop infrastructures. And so we are also going to build our cloud infrastructure. I think like that's one of the key um, aspects for us because there isn't any really need to create desktop web if you cannot give users that power to synchronize their resources. So maybe if you put a file on your mobile phone, you can just drop your phone and go to office and it's there on your computer system. And so we invest a lot of um, effort in building our cloud um, infrastructure. And one of, we are looking to work with um, Oracle cloud infrastructure to host our cloud infrastructure because it's kind of easier for us to start up with that due to like a lot of the job in terms of hosting service has actually been done by Oracle. Uh, thank you, doctor. Thanks. Okay. Thank you guys. Great um, presentation. Um, so I'll hand over to um, team Edutech. Are you guys ready to present? Do we have Team Edutech? You might be on mute. Team Edutech, are you there? Um, yes, please. I'm still trying to um, make a short set of Can you please give me like the next um, presentation, please? Okay. All right. We'll move on to package exchange. Let me just skip down. Package ex exchange. Are you ready? Can't get my words out. Team package exchange. Are you ready? Um, yeah, we are ready. Fantastic. Okay. All right, so just let me know when you're ready to move on to um, the next slide. Oh, okay. 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 Um, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sefas and I'm from Team Package Exchange and we comprise of <clears throat> Dorothy, Tony and Sally. So actually, Package Exchange is a delivery app that connects business owners with travelers for package delivery. So please, can we move to the next slide? So actually, we, act, uh, we looked through online with, uh, for some info, and we found out that 75% of SMEs in Africa loses revenue due to lack of delivery uh, delivery services available to them and their lack of uh, knowledge about the e-commerce ecosystem in, in the world. So what we are actually seeking to do right now is we will connect individuals because in Africa, people actually move around a lot. So we want to leverage on that and connect those people with businesses so we can actually bring together a big delivery system for 
the businesses in particular. Please, can we move on? So yes, yeah, so I, after after the research and stuff, hobby one um, some other stuff you also actually discovered is that existing delivery services such as DHL and FedEx and the rest they take high cuts for delivering, and other and other services have also come up like courier services around, but it's like their prices are way high because they will need to be charged tax from the government then they will need to also pay some other utility fees so they actually intend like in return push the cost to the businesses they are doing the, the delivery to and these businesses will intend push it to the customers so it actually creates a burden on the business owners just not to go for these services because home delivery will be like it's very expensive and it's a burden on the business owners as well as the customers. So what we are actually seeking to do is provide a cheap and reliable e-commerce delivery service for these businesses to leverage on. So please can we move on? Next slide. So, so our solution is a platform which businesses and individuals can hire travelers going in the direction of customer package delivery. So let's say I live in Accra and I usually travel to Lagos every week. I could just go onto the system and select my departure station. So I'll just select Accra. Then when I get to, I will select destination as Lagos and we'll just list a list of packages people are willing to pay me for to take to Lagos. And me going on my trip, I can actually make money on the trip at a convenience. So doing this, we are hoping to reduce the cost of package delivery and eliminate the burden of the distribution on, on business owners and pre present an e-commerce platform with a, with a reliable delivery service. This is because um, the more people use our service, the more like businesses, business owners will actually move their stuff online. So let's take, for example, there are a lot of thrift stores here in Ghana on Instagram, but their main problem is delivery because it's like someone goes to Instagram, they see the stuff. They are like, yeah, I want this, but the person is actually staying at the other far end of Ghana and uh, mostly these thrift stores are in Accra. So if someone is in the North, they cannot actually sell their package to someone in uh, in the south so let's take with our platform if the person orders if someone in the north uh, in the south orders something from the north um, the business owner will just need to go list on the on our platform to show people that he needs a delivery to be made to the north for him so someone on the website could just actually pick the person's number up and negotiate the price and that that way there's no actually fixed high fees as DHL and the other services will do. Please next slide. Yeah, so this goes back to the point again. So we are actually seeking to develop an affordable delivery service that allow businesses to go the extra mile for their customers while leveraging on the affordability while leveraging on affordability to increase revenue. So actually the more people use these delivery services, the more these businesses, these businesses increase their revenue and they are more likely to expand and employ more people. And even for the travelers themselves, someone, most people are unemployed here in Africa. So just to keep themselves busy, they can actually just pick this up as a business and just be delivering packages at their own convenience for money. Please next slide. So our target market is for SMEs. They are the core of this business actually. So we are actually looking to partner with um, university universities. So students who sell staffs can actually have delivery. So let's take this one instead of being at town to town, it could be like hostel to hostel deliveries. 
and we also looking to capture drop shippers because um, drop shippers nowadays, like in Africa, in Africa, like when they actually ship stuff from let's say China, I guess to let me use Ghana as an example. When it gets to Ghana, they find it difficult moving the stuff to um, the person who actually ordered the stuff from their website. So this actually is like bad for business. But with such a platform you are creating, these dropshippers can actually leverage on it. So they just be at their comfort of their home. When someone goes to their site and orders something, they order it from like overseas, when it gets in, they just do the deliver, um, they just list on our website, someone picks it up and takes it to wherever the delivery needs to be done. And it's actually a convenience for them. So apart from this main businesses, we are also looking to get individuals. So let's say, for example, I'm at home in Kumasi and I want to send something to Tony in Accra. So I could just, Instead, like instead of using a higher paid staff, like maybe going to the bus terminals or using DHL, I could just list and get someone from my locality and just hand the products over to the person to hand over to my friend in Accra. So please, next slide. So we actually size the market. In Ghana, we have about um, our population is about 30 million in total. And out of that 30 million, we have about um, 15 million, almost half, um, almost 15. So it's like almost 15 million people in like Ghana uses like the smartphone and they are on Instagram and the rest of the platforms. So we actually split, we actually took 10%, like 10, 10 million out and we actually <clears throat> size the market in Nigeria because most of we people in West Africa like we trade among ourselves a lot so most Ghanaians mostly buy from Nigerians and Nigerians mostly buy from Ghana and Nigeria has a population of about 100 million plus so let's say if you are to cut like you are to compare that to Ghana so you have about like 30 million or something a small fraction added to Ghana's 10 million will give you 40 million. So just with these two markets across Western Africa, we could actually be targeting 40 million people as customers. Then we also looking to expand to um, Eastern Africa because it's like when you live like let's say from Ghana to Nigeria and the rest of we in the sub-Saharan region, like in Western Africa, when you live the next our next destination is mostly Kenya, Tanzania or like in the east in Ethiopia. So we actually also sized their markets. We got Kenya's population to be like about 53 million and something. And we also like sized the other markets and we took a small fraction. So if you are to expand there, this is, we will actually know this, we will be targeting about 51 million people. So in total, we are actually looking to have a market size of 91 million full capacity across Africa. Business okay, if, you can, if you can wrap in the next minute. Okay. Okay, so we are also looking to raise like revenue through subscription and um, service usage and ask, please the next slide. Um, so this is our future roadmap. We are actually open up for other platforms. So if like, let's take for example, the dropshippers platform I was talking about, we could actually have an API for them just to integrate. So instead of them coming to list on our website, they will just need to do the integration at the back end and it's seamless. And we're also looking to bring on other e-commerce tools for usage and expanding to Northern and Southern Africa. Please next slide. And please, here's our team list. And um, please, can I share my screen? So I'll walk you through the demo. You have one minute for that. Oh, yeah, I'll do it quick. So, share screen. Yeah. Okay, so please, I'm sharing my screen. So, I'm going to our website. So, let's say someone comes to 
Um, this is actually an MVP, so it's just a snappy one of how it will look. But in the end, it will actually be a mobile app. For, but just for this demo, we did a web app. So someone just wants to send something, just comes to the platform. He goes to send, he selects the category. So if it's light, then test, let's say, fans shoes. Shoes, they select, they select, they select the category, they enter the name, and they choose a picture. They choose the package picture and they enter their number. Then they select their departure location and their destination. So let's say Lagos. And they, sorry, this has to go through. And the list, their post will be submitted for review. It works just like a classifier. So someone also looking to do delivery will just come to the site, select their departure and their destination. And yeah, they just pick up the info and do their negotiations. Thank you. Hello, guys. Great job. Yeah. Well done. Okay, so we'll open up to the judges for any questions. Yeah, I'll go. Um, I think it's a great presentation, uh, package exchange. Um, the only question I have is, I think your business model is heavily built around trust. And uh, how do you handle this um, uh, in this modern day and age? Uh, because liability will also be pegged on your platform if um, I want to send goods and they don't get to the destination. Uh, because I see, you know, maybe I'm going from Accra to, to, to Lagos. Uh, how sure am I that uh, the person who's going to deliver these goods will deliver them? Because that's a gap I see on this particular bit. Uh, secondly, how will you manage capacity? Because uh, from your business plan, uh, you're looking to scale up pretty fast uh, without uh, tying uh, this, this uh, basic uh, you know, principles on safety, liability and all that. Uh, you answered my question on integration when you presented your external roadmap. So mine is just that. Okay, so about the liability part. So um, for those picking up the packages, this is the presentation was just an MVP. So we actually be doing background checks, just like what Uber does. So we take their ID and stuff. So the more someone does more deliveries successful, the more they get rated and the more they are more trustworthy with like high, like high price deliveries. So in, if someone is actually doing a delivery with a high priced, um, let's say item, we will actually have to like, we just build an algorithm to shift through, to link them with someone with a higher, a higher rating and a higher trustability level. Excellent, thanks. Thank you. I think there's a good, uh, business value in uh, your idea and uh, it seems uh, you want to make everyone a uber or a taxi but uh, the real uh, elements of cost would be you know these package delivery companies make money in pulling the packages and then using one mode of transport so i'm thinking if it is me who is going from accra to somewhere else, why, what is that cost that you're going to charge the, to the customer that would be enough for both me, paying me to transport it and you getting your commission uh, that would be more competitive than the rest of the competitors? Okay, thank you for the question. So actually we are not actually um, seeking to like so let's let me tell you our business model is mainly based on people traveling so it's like you are you actually have your money and you are moving from let's say accra to lagos so you do this on a, a daily basis so we are actually offering you um, a means to actually cut down your transportation cost and you can actually pick up more packages so the more packages you pick on your journey the more money you make actually Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, uh, Sefas, for that uh, presentation. I think it's uh, you've done a thorough research in terms of building the business case, and also it's it's a quite innovative, trying to uh, 
uh, lower down the cost of transportation and even create employment to people who would be willing to transport cargo or goods as they commute. Um, I think I find it quite viable, especially between when, you, when you're talking about courier and commodities within borders. Mm -hmm. Because then in that case, you are, there's nobody to vet you or rather to vet the goods and you and, and anybody within say Lagos or Accra or Nairobi can be able to move from one location to the other with the good at a reasonable price. That's I think a problem we each face when we're not able to get Uber or FedEx in, in good time to transport something that you want transported say from, from the city to where you are. So I think that's a plus. Um, one question I have or a consideration that you should make uh, is when it comes to cross border uh, goods transfer, then there's a lot of things that you'll need to focus on such as, for example, um, regulations and compliance. How are you going to vet that the goods that are going to be moved from one place to the other are in compliance, they're not restricted goods, people are not shipping drugs or guns or things that are restricted uh, in Lagos or in UAE or wherever it is that they are going. And who's going to be tackling the inspection of these goods so that uh, there's no, you're not using Hilda moving from Lagos to Accra to escape, for people to escape tax, uh, to evade tax payment. Yeah, so I think that's one of the, some of the considerations when you roll out or when you go to international or cross border rollout. The easiest rollout would probably be within the borders. It would be quite viable. But for cross border, I don't know whether you've considered how you're going to ensure that um, the travelers or the person uh, who's using this service does not evade tax payment and is not, uh, is not transmitting restricted goods and who's going to carry out the inspection of this product for verification, which is what FedEx and DHL and Uber would do when it comes to cross-border transfers. Okay, thank you for the question. So actually, um, for this was this MVP was actually built for like small, like the local economy in mind, but for the cross-border one, you actually like have the you actually have a thorough check. So let's say someone wants to send something to Nigeria. We will, when the person lists on our website, we will have a double pickup. So they will, um, someone will pick from the persons and bring it to our office. So it's like we do the, the scan and the checks before the final person picks it up to their destination. This means there will be a bit of um, increase in price for but uh, for cross-border ones, but it will actually be more cheaper than using, let's say, DHL. Okay, all right, that's that's fair enough. What about the tax payment? You probably want to also consider that in the cross-border as well. Um, for the tax payment, so we actually also like um leveraging on, let's say, the person taking it there as a as their possession. So. Um, for the tax payment, I think it's the person transporting is is just negotiating the person. Uh, it's just left the it's just the person taking it to the other side. It's negotiation with the um, the main um, the main businesses. So it's like let's say I'm the one supposed to take it from Accra to Lagos. So when I'm supposed to pick it up from um, um, the office of let's say our company. Um, you link you uh, to the businesses, so you actually have to negotiate that with them. So if you are actually supposed to pay something, you let them know so they actually just add it on. So it's like this way they are they are hiring you in a way to do their delivery for them. All right, uh, fair enough. I think uh, it's it's worthwhile. Uh, I, I like the local transfer aspect. I think uh, it's a good idea, quite innovative. Well done. Thank you. Anil, did you have some feedback? Oh, sorry, yes, I was on mute um, okay. on my laptop. So uh, I think it was a, uh, I have to say uh, that it's a very creative and out of the box idea. Um, and obviously you have a clarity in terms of who your target market is. 
and you even did the market size estimation. So, you know, done, uh, you really done a good homework. Uh, just to add to what other judges were mentioning, I think uh, when we are dealing with the individuals, uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, backbone support which will be required. You know, people will not uh, be delivering on time. Sometimes it will not be traceable. So I think you will need to see how you're going to provide some sort of a backbone support to deal with these kind of issues. And then obviously regulatory as uh, Hilda was mentioning is, uh, is, a, is a big one, uh, which I think uh, as of now, we do not have uh, enough clarity. So you might want to work on those and then it can be a very good idea to explore further. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Well done, CFAS, and to your team as well. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on. Um, so, Team Farm Tech, are you ready to present? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Prince Chair Mecca, um, the lead in you know, FANTEC. Basically, we are um, contesting at, um, on the um, health track. FANTEC, we, at FANTEC, we built a device that leverages on artificial intelligence and more. Um, and the more build of computer anchored on blockchain computing system to to check the our health condition. What what it does it um, take into consideration our heart rate um, or uh, blood saturation, um, our BMI, our systolic uh, blood pressure, and our diastolic blood pressure. With the help of artificial intelligence, it can tell how healthy or the state of one's health. Um, in our team, um, um, I am Prince Chemaka from Nigeria and uh, I'm a primary health tech worker, a, a developer and a coder. And also we have Ms. Asobi from Morocco who happens to be the CEO, a cybersecurity expert and a software engineer. And also have Menzi Toro from South Africa, software engineer. And uh, finally, Tato, Sosesi uh, from South Africa, who is the CEO, next slide, and CFO. Next slide. So what is the problem? The problem here we are about to solve, we are trying to solve is that 40% of Africans have no access to modern health facilities. And, uh, and if you happen to see any of the primary health care, is that they are overloaded and uh, they are short of staff. So also the World Bank Group um, uh, and the United Nations population is made that in 2015 alone, around 300,000 uh, 300, women died as a result of um, or, um, or pregnancy or childbirth, leaving hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of children without um, or, um, or mother. Um, specifically, this research was done in Nigeria and statistic has it that over 4 million Africans die as a result of as a result of ignorance to their state of health and finally nearly half of all deaths and about a third of disability in low and middle um, countries could have been avoided if people had access to proper health care. Next one. Okay, I will introduce our CEO to go on and explain this. Over to Nisa. All right, uh, thank you, Prince. Our solution is uh, that we take uh, some measurements of uh, some devices that's going to be related to the human body, uh, like uh, the measurements of the heart rate, saturation of uh, oxygen on blood, the weight, the height, the systolic blood pressure, 
the historic broad question. And the help of the artificial intelligence, we already uh, did some algorithms that calculate like uh, the cardiac output, the cardiac index, the body surface area, the stroke volume, the cardiac output, you know, the body surface area too. So it's gonna give us uh, the risks and the solutions of, uh, or even like it can know uh, if you have uh, a heart attack or heart failure, it, too much of this. Next slide, please. So the hardware solution is gonna be Hello? Lisa, are you here? Uh, oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, so the hardware solution is uh, look uh, similar to this. It's a uh, uh, couple of uh, the first prototype, which is this, it's look bigger, but it has no uh, uh, risk on the health uh, uh, of the human body. Uh, uh, this mean, uh, instead of like uh, using like for the brain, the IMR, we don't use the X-ray because it's uh, very dangerous of the human body. It can uh, lead to cancer and the much uh, other risks. So we use the IMR. Here we can measure other stuff as I mentioned before. I can explain it to the next slide, please. So on the prototype, we have uh, the heart rate. Here is the health system. We have the heart rate that's gonna give us the heart rate variability that's gonna conclude us if the uh, if you have a stress or not. Uh, it's gonna give us the stroke volume with the cardiac output in the heart rate. It's gonna give us this uh, uh, SO2, the saturation of uh, oxygen on blood um, in the height and with it uh, with the BMI, BSI. Uh, this historic blood pressure and the historic blood pressure with the post uh, pressure. Every such of these things have like um, algorithm which make like, if like uh, the heart rate is not uh, normal, it's uh, high than 100, this is not normal. So inform uh, in uh, uh, the user that you're gonna tell him that you have a heart, uh, uh, heart rate very high. So uh, you need to do this, you need to not do this, like uh, stop sitting too much, or you need, uh, if it's uh, very critical, you need to go to the doctor right now. Uh, so um, our prototype is uh, easy, uh, real, uh, give us real time reporting of health state, faster and stable measurement. This is why we have the contact with the, uh, the body, uh, that arm uh, devices, portable and easy to use instead of uh, like, um, uh, visiting each doctor and see like, or waiting for every patient to go for each uh, device, like seeing the heart rate and the blood pressure, then seeing the IMR for the brain. We can all do this in nearly 10 seconds. So it, the, and, uh, it's of course uh, less good. So I'm gonna let uh, my colleague uh, continue for you. Thank you. I just know you have two more minutes. Next slide. Okay, um, as you are wait, wait, waiting for our team member, um, uh, the decent features of the of our of our device is real time reporting of health state with the help of artificial intelligence. It can um, tell if um, the state of health, it can I even advise you, this is what you're gonna do to um, remain healthy. This is the things you have to cut and too much um, salt, too much this, you have to less it. And also fast and stable measures. We did, we, uh, we all know that um, these days we have overcrowded um, hospitals. So and um, scanning centers are very hard to get. So, but with our device, it does really well help um, in um, re re reducing the num number of time it, it, um, it will take a doctor to attend to a patient. So you take this in 10 seconds, it is, port it is portable and easy to use. You can take it to a anywhere because it's portable and um, it costs um, below 100. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide, okay. 
uh, more like I say, th this is our unique value proposition. It is uh, more, it can be used anywhere, it can be used in hospitals, and it, you can also use it because it is way, way below USSD, uh, more 100 USD, helps to detect primary health challenges in just five minutes, mm -hmm. uh, can attend to 100% a day and fast and same. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, um, uh, our ma market opportunity. Okay, so, hello? Yeah, market opportunity. Um, uh, we have, we've done our market re research. I found that many African countries have been able to meet a growing demand for quality healthcare and they spent over 3.2 billion USD. And also, we also found out that African health industry is characterized by a huge division between private and public sector. But we want to bring this opportunity, we want to leverage on, on this fact by a more bringing a device that can be used either in private, in public, or even on a personal basis. So our target market specifically want to start in Nigeria or, or South Africa. Next slide. Okay, good day, good day, everyone. This is nice Menzim Doro, the um, yes, this is Menzim Doro, the um, chief technical officer of the um, FarmTech Solutions. I'll be outlining the assumptions and the limitations of our project. To be brief, our limitations in the project is that the the, the project only assists in health-related sicknesses. That means it can only detect sicknesses that are related to the heart only. And then the next one is that the sizes of the wearables haven't been confirmed yet, meaning that. We have only um, designed the, the prototype only, but we will still confirm the sizes as the time goes. And then the other one is that the project will be distributed more on the disadvantaged areas, which are the rural areas and the public hospitals. And then the assumptions of us, um, the, what, we assume, what we assume about the project is that everyone needs this, needs this I'm sorry about that, everyone needs this, this device, you know, and then it will be available at a reasonable cost. It will also be regularly updated and modified, meaning that even after the product has been released, it will be updated and keep, um, kept modified for um, better efficiency and better um, updates. And then our competition in this device is the um, smartwatches that are ranged from Samsung, Apple, and Fitbit, and then the companies that create the chips for smartwatches like Quadrum, and then the existing medical equipment. What will differentiate us from this, um, the competitors is that we will be focused um, specifically on the health of the people, and it won't be it won't be about the profit, but um, the well-being of uh, African people. Next slide, please. Uh, you're, you're what we ask from? What, excuse me. Uh, I'll let you finish your last slide, but you're way over by a few minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, our ask from the, um, the the investors is that um, can we get the funding of the project so that we can run the application the system in Africa first in South Africa before we can um, release them in all African countries. And then our second ask is that we get the green light to start working on the system. And then our last ask is that the, we provide us with the platform to present the idea on all African health departments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we'll open up for judges to ask any questions. I think it's a great presentation. It's learning here. Um, just a couple of things from my side. Uh, being that you're collecting data from, you know, people in the rural areas, and most importantly from people, how do you plan to handle the, the, the privacy of, of, of this data? That's one. And uh, the second thing is um, a lot is anchored on the smart devices and uh, the biggest target market you're looking at are the people in the rural areas. So funding becomes um, a quite a challenge if not if it doesn't come through, the project pretty much cannot kick off. So how are you looking to strike the balance between the two? Because uh, I think the technology, the idea is great, the target market is great, but the limiting factors are, are quite glaring uh, to, to any success on this project. Uh, thank you, Judge. Uh, for the thing of the, the question of the privacy, it's uh, it doesn't uh, our product it doesn't even require internet or uh, any wearable stuff like phone or any external device. So every 
measure we have uh, done, we only uh, print uh, a report uh, to, uh, to, we send it to a printer by Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. So the, uh, instead of waiting, as I said, uh, uh, three or four or five uh, patients before you, you will just put your hand on that device for 10 seconds. It's generate reports of everything, heart rate, historic, pressure, everything, and it's calculated uh, um, with these factors, everything. So for the privacy, it's only gonna say between you and the doctor. After all, it's just a document as we, as the other devices did. Instead of uh, wasting time waiting every patient in did test, in did test, in did test, we did everything in uh, such uh, 10 seconds. Uh, for uh, the funding, we already uh, calculate the budget is less than $100. It's like uh, we assemble for the first type uh, prototype, we assemble such uh, devices like uh, uh, we're gonna use the Arduino with uh, like for the uh, heart rate, the heart rate uh, measure uh, and for uh, like uh, the air quality environment, the MQ1, uh, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with it or not, but we already have the list uh, of uh, every each uh, device we're gonna use in the, the last uh, prototype. Thanks. So a uh, good presentation. Uh, the question I have is the fitness industry and uh, the wearables gadget are already taking some of these metrics or measures and uh, it's only a matter of time when they would probably grow into doing what you're doing. So how do you anticipate that? How are you looking to fend that off? And how would you really monetize this? All right, thank you, Judge uh, Abdullah. Uh, the idea is that uh, we don't aim for fitness right now, but we can make uh, uh, the prototype more smaller and smaller till a smartwatch or something like this because there is a but that's gonna need more budget because we're gonna need the optical devices like for the blood pressure and stuff like this but we didn't aim for this because our main issue is that uh, the infrastructure of uh, the healthcare on Africa is very low because not we have already think about not everybody gonna cross five kilometers uh, from his town or from his village to the other hospital so he uh, can know his heart rate or why why what causing his heart failure or his stroke on the brain or something like that, or these symptoms or something like this so we already talked about the main issue it's on Africa so uh, this is it we can make another uh, prototype of the fitness but it's gonna cost us uh, more because we need the uh, small uh, yeah, stuff. okay okay I want to I want to add to him what, 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 what he said um, basically if you watch those um, firms that are into fitness like um, the Apple um, or uh, smartwatch um, or wearables that, that we have, they don't have an algorithm that can um, bring those um, checks, those um, data it collected to know if someone is healthy. And I get you said in the nearest future that they might think of going into that, um, that, that um, angle. Yes, of course, we have a plan for it. In fact, um, as a matter of fact, this um, te technology we have We've already developed first, second, third, and fourth generation of this technology. And what we want to bring into play, just a first generation. So when we are seeing more competition, we will introduce second generation. We've already thought about it. But what these guys are doing are just your fitness, telling you this is your heart rate for you to know. But we are bringing all this data together with the help of artificial intelligence to know if you need more water in your body, if there's more, uh, more if there's lack of air in the, in the blood vein, if, this, if, if you need um, just um, exercise, or if you have to go and see a doctor. And, and it does it in a minimum of um, or, um, or five million minutes, and you will get your um, re results. Thank you. OK, um, thank you team. Uh, 
Comtech for your presentation. Uh, very, again, another great idea that has been incubated and brought forth in the healthcare space. Um, just a quick question, uh, who is the target end user? Is it meant for home care or for home users or is it meant to be used at medical facilities in rural areas? Okay, uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, we aim uh, for sure the both. This is why we said it's uh, portable and easy to use. We can even use it at home if you can afford to buy this uh, uh, device, our project, or you can put only one in a hospital and uh, it's gonna cost only 10 seconds. This is what's gonna cost uh, for each uh, uh, patient uh, measurement. This is the uh, idea. Okay. So okay, I, I want to add to, to, to what, what, what he said. Our beachhead markets now are, are more the, the health fa fa facilities. These are the people who want to, the, these are the people who want to start with, we want to start specifically with the health uh, more, uh, more fa facilities in Africa. Then from there, we can now push it to everybody. Like, like my colleague said, it can be used um, or um, at homes, in your homes, you can buy it and use it. But our B-shared market now, the people who want to start with uh, the health fa facility managers in Africa. Thank you. Okay, then the second question, thank you for that clarification. <clears throat> and the second question, which will probably build on to what the doctor has said, Dr. Ibrahim has said is, if you look at um, the wearables that are already in the market, uh, are you considering developing both the hardware that's going to be taking signals or uh, sending the sensors to, to your environment to be able to do artificial intelligence and advice over and above what the ordinary um, gadgets are able to do? Or are you just focusing on using the already existing wearables, but now get gathering that data and doing AI on it? So which are you focusing on both the hardware and then the AI bit of it, or are you just taking control from the existing wearable and then doing AI on it? Because then for your hardware gadgets, then they have to go through the mini health ministry's approval that they are safe enough for people to use and the health facilities to use. And then they also have to, and even from a data perspective, I don't think it should be an obstacle for you to say and ask the doctors and the patients to give consent to have their data uh, analyzed because uh, if the ministry allows for you to capture this data for the greater good of, of, of reduction in mortality, then that is fine. I don't think you should uh, restrict yourself from getting uh, customers and patients to give consent to their data. So I think you should just go in with an open mind, even uh, in as much as yeah, Lenin has given you a point to consider, you have to get permission from patients because that is what AI um, thrives on. You have to get the data for you to analyze. So yeah, are you focusing on hardware or software or are you leveraging, are you going to complement what's already in the market? Uh, yes, thank you, Ma'am Helda. Uh, we don't uh, take on consideration on the second uh, phase uh, on what's on the targets. Uh, first of all, we had made uh, a big research. We have talked to some uh, doctors on uh, each like uh, uh, symptoms and stuff like that. Everything we had to collect, we collected it. We made these algorithms, but we didn't publish it. Uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't require even uh, a big brain or something like this, but we are making, uh, uh, are assembling what doesn't exist even. We are making something new to the uh, Africa, something mm -hmm. that uh, uh, maybe yeah. Prince will uh, explain okay, this. Woman. All right. Well, thank you for what you said. Um, the advice you, you, you gave us will be open-minded on that because honestly, artificial intelligence, machine hmm. learning thrives on um, data. So. We will try to get the consent of um, both um, or, um, the doctors and um, patients to, to, um, to do that. But um, or, honestly, we, 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 we thought about either um, leave, leave 
leveraging on already existing technology and then do, doing some modification. But um, if you're a programmer um, at the back end, um, trying to, to um, use an already um, existing technology will not give you the flexibility you need. And also there might be some, um, some um, backdoor at the end that will give the owner of the of the of the um, technology who you are leveraging on access to some of your work, whether you like it or not. So that is why, as you can see from um, us, we we are a compact team. We have a um, full stack developer. We have AI specialists among us, and we've already developed an algorithm. So we are doing both the hardware stuff and the software stuff, we, uh, we are just starting it over uh, um, by ourselves. We are not like trying to le leverage or um, build our te technology on an already, uh, already existing technology. So we want to build it, build it ourselves. We've already start, um, started, we, uh, we, uh, we've, we've done some algorithm already, both the software and the hardware. We will do, do it ourselves afresh. And thank you. All right, thank you and all the best. Thank you. It's a great thank you very uh, much. Thank you for the opportunity and the, your time. All right, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the feedback, judges. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna building a, a break. Um, we're gonna have a 10 minute break, um, toilet break, go and get a cup of tea or a drink. Um, and we will come back um, in 10 minutes where we'll um, have the tribe. So the tribe, please be ready um, at half past 11 GMT to present. Um, and then we'll go back to Team Edutech after the tribe. So if we all go and have a break right now, and then we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. Our recording, we are now back from our break um, and we're going to kick off with Team Tribe. So I'm gonna go back to sharing. Okay, so Team Tribe. Ready when you are. I had a quick question. So on the presentation sure. links, did you manage to open them? Because we'll be using them for the practical bit. For the practical bit, if you just let me know when you get to that and then I can kick it back over to you and you can share directly from your end. Okay, so we'll be going back and forth. So do you mind if we present? Or I can okay. click on it. If it's easy enough, I can click on it. That's fine. Okay. Um, is it going to have audio and video? No. No? No. Okay. Okay. All right. Ready to go when you are. I just continue to, when you, while you're presenting. Okay. Okay. I'm saying. Okay. Will you really continue sharing the skill, the yes. screen, or do I do that? I'll You'll share. That. I'll share the screen, um, and then when we get to the bits where um, you need to do a demo, if it's just the link, I'm happy to click on those. Um, so it may take time to open the link. Yeah, open on this end. If they're open on your end, then you can. I'll stop sharing so that you can share on your end. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay. Okay. Hi everyone. So today we'll be looking at a subset of artificial intelligence, which is machine learning, and we'll be looking at neural networks, and we'll be looking at CNN. And yeah, so next slide. So our problem statement in Africa, patients take time before they get lab results. And with fast killing diseases such as TB, this has become a problem. So our solution used, entails using CNN is an algorithm that uses computer vision to classify images in real time and return results immediately. Next slide. 
x. So we are a team of four. We have Fatima from Nigeria. She's a software engineer. We have Sam, a data scientist from Nigeria too. Paul, data scientist and machine learning engineer. And myself, Tom, machine learning scientist and engineer. Both of us are from Kenya. Next. Next. So with tuberculosis infection still active amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, without that, coming up with a solution to automate other tasks in hospital will reduce the overwhelming task load. So our objective of this, of this project is to build a model that classifies chest X-ray images with an accuracy of 85% and above. Next, please. In 2019, we had 1.4 million deaths as a result of COVID of TB out of 10 million who fell sick. Out of that, 2008 were HIV positive, so meaning that they, they died as a because of an underlying condition. And according to WHO, TB is the leading infectious cost of death worldwide. Next slide. In Africa, we said it might take 72 hours. This is because Radiologists are the only people who can interpret lab results. So you have scarce or maybe inadequate, as one may work for up to three hospitals. Next slide. Our solution entails using the digital radiography in the hospitals, which will be connected to our API, and it sends in real-time images as it captures the chest X-ray images and the API returns the results immediately. Next slide. The radiography is simply the technology they use to capture chest X-rays. The API receives the images and returns the outcome. The outcomes are in real time. So a picture, an X-ray image is returned immediately. Next slide, please. So we are trying to make radiologists work easier by using computer vision, that is CNN algorithm. Next. Next. So we have future plans. We also want to include in our algorithm other lung disorders, as well as build a mobile application and automate all lab results. These include limbs so that we apply this machine learning to other underlying and other conditions too. We're also planning to include natural language processing that is NLP to help doctors integrate with this system easier and faster. NLP is basically how your Siri works. So you can talk to it or you can text it and results are more faster. Next slide. As well as stop sharing so that we may continue. Okay, shall I pass to you now? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. So I'll, I'll take you through our notebook, what we did. So we took a data set that contained images that were labeled as either positive or negative. So by positive, it means that these were images for patients who, are, who had a positive test for tuberculosis and the rest of the images were for the patients who had a negative outcome for the test. So from this particular notebook, we did a couple of things and one of them was to visualize the images as you can see there. Then we, we created our trained data set, which contained the, both the, the images for the positive and the negative patients. And then from there, we went ahead on to build our model. So from our model, we were able to achieve uh, an, a 90% a 90 accuracy, but it depended on the number of convolutions and the number of nodes that we were using. So these were the outputs that we were getting. So depending on the number of convolution layers and the number of nodes, 
and the number of dense layers, these were the accuracies that we were getting. So we decided that our base model was the one that had four convolution layers, that's two nodes and one dense layer. So we, exp we went ahead to export our model as a JSON file so that we can work with it uh, on our website. So I'll let my counterpart take you through the website that we built. Yes, so this, yeah. Okay, good afternoon. All right, so we went, um, I hope everyone can hear me. Okay, so we went ahead to model a website to help deliver our solution. So when we get data from integrating our API with hospitals and getting those data from the hospitals when they take, when they make an X-ray scan as we elaborated on. So the API will stay on their machine the machine, once X has been taken, the API will capture that image from their machine, transport it into our website on our server. Then our server will analyze that result. And after that, that result has been analyzed through the API, it will communicate back to the machine with the result. So the the uh, chief radiographer can also see the results get gotten from our system and vet it. And also the hospital can get real time results based on the model that will be hosted on our server. So what we've done with our page is we have developed a model landing page that reflects our, our solution and reflects what we want it to achieve with ease of access to and through the website. And we've also integrated a login. The login is specialized because uh, it does not have a sign up page. Once our model has been implemented, the organization or the companies or the hospitals rather that we go to, those hospitals will, will give them login ID and give them our API that will integrate on their machine. So all they need to do is to view whatever detail they want to view. They have to come to our website and then sign in and then they can have access for the back end where they can, inter they can interface with the API view, previous last re previous results, previous uh, um, ratings and analysis that we have gotten from our uh, server on our back end. So also um, the API interfaces with the, the server on the hospital, so it can also be scalable. So we can have multiple hospitals subscribe to our platform. And all we need to do is just install the APIs individually for them and generate IDs for them. So we can provide the solution to as many hospitals across Africa to help reduce the effect of um, the debt and cost of TV. So to upscale this solution, we'll be leveraging on, uh, we hope to leverage on Oracle server. So because we understand that as we upscale and engage more hospitals to provide, to deploy the solution, we need to have a much larger database to help accumulate the, the API inflow and also um, accumulate our model as it expands. So we also want to leverage on um, Oracle Cloud uh, Services, because we would deploy this on the Oracle Credit, we understand that it will get exhausted as we expand the solution. So having a much more larger database will help us upscale better and faster. That is all for, for, for our group. Great, thank you guys so much. So I'll hand over to the judges now. I, I I think uh, that was very well executed. Um, my only question is, how are you handling uh, security of the data? Being that uh, your service comes as you know complementary and is filling a gap on what most hospitals are not doing, how do you handle the security of these APIs? Being that uh, not uh, each hospital has the same HMIS. Uh, by that I mean hospital management information systems. But great presentation, guys. I think Paul will take that question. Okay, so thank you for the question. So the, the data that we're using to train our model is actually will work for each and every hospital because for to, to detect a patient with TB, 
um, once we train our data, uh, once we train our model, then we'll just export our model to our server, whereby it will be loading pro directly from our server. So the security will be imp implemented directly from our server. So the only person that can be able to access that particular model, um, actually you cannot be able to access the model itself, but you can access the services provided by the model. So what you're going to do to, to use the website, you just upload a picture of a patient who has, who has TB, and then the model will just work be on the background um, on the server and then give you the result instantly. So you the, you'll not be able to access the model directly. So this means that we'll be able to secure our data and nobody will be able to access the data used to train the model. You can only be able to access the services offered by our website. Maybe just to add on that, Sam has something to say. Okay, uh, thank you so much, sir, for that uh, question. It's a, really it's a really vital question. So as part of our security, we understand that uh, user data is, uh, is, a, is a big thing. And we understand that user data is a critical thing not to let loose just like that. So as part of our web security, when we upscale this solution, we are going to be getting the service of top security expert talk about nothing to help secure our data on our database and also um, leverage on Oracle security also to help secure our database from attack and data leak. And also we're going to get each um, organized, each hospitals we work with, we're going to ensure we, we uh, implement stringent security measures with them to ensure that data goes between them and us. And we're also going to make sure we do regular checks on our APIs on their system, either uh, by monthly or three times a month to ensure that our solution remains secure and tight within our database. Good presentation, guys. Uh quick question would be around, are you thinking of selling this as a user license to the hospital so that uh, it's installed in the system and they can continue utilizing it to make uh, the, the, the diagnosis one? And the second one would be, uh, how would you uh, be able to deal with a trust issue? Remember patients, would rather trust a doctor who will look at that X-ray to come up with a, a diagnosis or a finding rather than an AI machine that would be able to make that diagnosis. So there's, there's a skepticism around that now that it is still new. How do you intend to tackle those two areas? Thanks, thanks, thanks. We appreciate the feedback. So on the question of user license, so basically this is one part. We are looking to integrate more models on other on other parts of the body, especially when it comes to chest X-rays. So we want to solve the problem of all X-ray photos, all lung diseases, so they're able to be recognized by by the by the algorithm that is CNN. So basically. Yeah, we could think about that user license. We had we had not thought about the the business perspective of the model. So yeah, we could implement that. That is after testing. So basically, we need the, to test the model more. So we're thinking of approaching hospitals like Nairobi Hospital to have this model tested out so that it can so I can bring more trust, especially as what you are saying. So. I think change is inevitable. So patients will have to, they may be when the patient is not comfort, comfortable, they can lie us again with the, with the radiologist for a confirmation. But what basically we are trying to bridge is the time before treatment starts. So it's 72 hours before treatment starts for TB in Africa. That is enough for a patient to probably succumb to the, to the illness. So we are probably, trying to bridge that but in case a patient doesn't feel comfortable is more than welcome or she to wait until the the radiology the, the radiologist is available in the hospital to analyze the results so thanks again for your question. okay i think my comments as has been said is uh this is a very 
great innovation. Again, thank you for the presentation, Team Tribe. And um, I like what you're doing within the healthcare space using AI to automate some of the processes that are very cumbersome and slow. Uh, I think for me, it will just be a comment for consideration even as you go on uh, evaluating and testing this. You said one of the places you're going to test at is one of the major hospitals in Kenya, which is Nairobi Hospital. Um, I think you might want to look at deploying and testing as well as you're doing the testing, uh, getting uh, the test evaluation from the end users such as radiologists and the doctors. You might also want to test the solution by deploying it on a cloud, on Oracle Cloud platform. By that, I mean deploying your AI models on Oracle Cloud, deploying the security aspect of how people log in, using multi-factor authentication, using Oracle Cloud platform as well, because there's a free tire where you can try that as well. Um, uh, whether or not you get the, the credits, I'm just saying this so that you can just be open-minded. You can test the website on the platform. That way, it is a, it is even easier to scale. If it is in Nigeria or in Kenya or in South Africa, then it doesn't really matter where the customer or the hospital is based. The platform is the same, and it can be deployed. If you want to deploy it in Argentina, then you don't have to start installing anything anywhere. You're just going to connect the hospital data and the scans to your cloud-based solution. That is one comment that uh, I would want to pose there. Then the second comment is around, like you said, change is inevitable. Uh, maybe you can also start thinking about in the roadmap as you're looking at na natural language processing to make it much easier, like talking in Kiswahili or in Yoruba or in um, all those other languages is also having a different end user, that is the patient. So because uh, we are living in an era whereby if I can, yes, get this information as a patient, I don't have to go to the hospital. Can I log in and see my all my scans from when I was small and see how my lungs have been progressing? I can be able to see the results either by a web platform or by USSD or by SMS or by an app, then you're really going to, you're targeting and reaching millions or billions of Africans around the continent and empowering them to have access to their healthcare. So they won't be waiting for three days or a week. And even in some cases, two weeks, they'll be getting their information via USSD and being told you either have TB or you don't have, or you either have uh, whatever disease it is. So yeah, so in the roadmap, you can also think at, uh, at uh, e expanding the access to, to individuals and to patients as well. Thanks for the insights. Okay. All right. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, okay. So we're going to move on to our final um, presentation. Um, this is Team Edutech. Um, can I just confirm, Team Edutech, are you ready? Fantastic. Okay. Let me go ahead and okay okay and you're ready to go and then the members are Angela and some next slide I'll just uh, please you want to up your volume a little bit so the judges can hear you Okay. Um, our challenge team is education. Please, is the volume okay? Uh, still not okay. Try to speak out more, please. Our challenge team is education. Is it better? Uh, yes, a bit better. Just keep that tone. Okay, sure. Our challenge team is education. And then the problem statement goes as follows. So we are saying that um, first years ICT or computer science students face a wide variety of challenges. Not only must they contend with the pressure of commencing tertiary education with all the issues associated with adjusting from high school to university study, they, they are also confronted with immersing themselves into a discipline in which they may have, they may not have any had, they may not have had any prior formal education and for which they must essentially learn a new language. That is a programming language. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a pie chart showing um, the reasons why people drop out of 
from um, computer programming or IT courses. So um, what, as, as I said previously, we have people who drop out regularly due to the fact that they don't have any prior knowledge on this and they, seem, they tend to um, see it to be difficult. So the pie chart shows that 45% of people who um, enrolled in computer science in the universities didn't enjoy the course, so they dropped out during, before completing their undergraduate program. And then 25, 30% um, of them also said the course was too difficult, so they couldn't take and continue with the undergraduate program. And then 25 of them had other reasons for dropping out. So we are trying to ident we are trying to um, implement, we are trying to bring um, computer languages or programming languages to the basic um, basic levels of education. That is introducing them to the younger ones or the children who are in basic school so they can pick it up at an early stage. Please, next slide. Yes. So unlike other courses like um, inter science, create maybe creative arts, even um, English and math, computer programming or programming languages are not being taught from a basic um, level, which makes it difficult for people at the tertiary level to grasp or have a full upper hand on the program. So our solution is to develop a website tailored purposely to suit the minds of African children. This website is going to be fun, interactive, and animated. And it's going to um, host um, programming languages and other ICT-related topics, which enable the children to um, access such things and have a fair idea or fair knowledge on what is going on in the programming world. We're also going to have um, a, an online customer support based on regions. This this refer this means that um, in case we the plan is to make um, every challenge have a an, an a volunteer. Okay, so in case the child is unable to complete that challenge, the child would have to contact the volunteer who is um, really, um who is based in that region. So the volunteer would have to speak to them on a mindset that, okay, yes, we are from the same particular place, so we know what you're going to. If they had to use local languages to, they would use local languages to their children understand better what is going on. And it's self-paced and flexible. That's like, the child decides, it's, it's not like, it's not a timetable-based website. So the child comes in and decides to whether learn two topics a day or just one a day. Next slide, please. So our target market, we are targeting basic schools, parents or guardians, governments and NGOs. So basic schools, because basic schools are where the children we are targeted at are based at. They, we are looking at children in basic schools. So sexual, uh, technically, basic schools are our main target market. And we're looking at parents and guardians because they are the ones who um, give the children the motive or give the children the, the um, veto power or the, the, the thing to move forward to do courses. Some parents don't really see, see um, ICT or computer programming as a course to be done. People prefer their children doing medicine over computer programming. So we would like to change their mindset towards that and then enable them and um, help um, make them help us push their children towards learning and um, computer programming skills. And then governments and NGOs, so they can also help fund the um, the website in various schools or to the less privileged children in the less privileged schools. Next slide, please. So our competitions are Kodakid, Educative.io, W3S schools, and SoloLearn. These are uh, like among just a few out of a lot of the competitions we have. So what makes our product different from these competitions? Our product is, um, it has volunteers on site is an online volunteer it has an online, online volunteer support com community that is as i said previously they are going to be basically there to support the children in case they come against it uh, come they face any challenge that they can't move ahead of and then it's also going to have um, the teachers who are going to be loading their content online to enable the children to learn and then it's also fun and animated unlike the unlike so okay some are not purposely meant for children some are meant for people who are maybe like having difficulties during the undergrad program. So it's not that kind of interactive and fun for kids. And it's also um, focused mainly on the African children. So that's, please the next slide. Okay, so our assumptions or limitations. Our limitations has to do with the lack of access to internet by most of the kids or some of the 
kits in basic schools and then the lack of access to hard computer hardware. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll ask, um, in order for this, the whole plan is to make this website um, a monthly subscription website. So when the child subscribes to the um, channel, the, the child gets free access to all the contacts on the channel or on the website, even though some of the contents will be for free, but not all will be for free. So we want to partner with government and NGOs for the provision of hardware and stable community internet connections and provisions in schools so like they would um maybe provide computer hardware and internet connections in basic schools so that children can have easy access to this and then they also um, would have to maybe fund the program in the schools so that the schools can have um unlimited access to the website in their schools and they also have to partner with volunteers across the co continent so that they would help us host the online support system and then support from parents and school staff to enable the children or to encourage the children to take up this um, website and learn from it next slide please okay so please can i share my screen i would like to show you the design for the website thank you sure go ahead Okay, so this is um, how the website is supposed to look like. This is where you log in. When you log in, this is what you're supposed to see. So this, you have your account, your email and stuff. Then, because you are new, you'd have to sign up. So the sign up comes here. And then verification of your email. So this is where the person's um, name is. So it's like a landing page for the names. Then we have the landing page for the, um, so this is like the person that's opened the, their account. So this is what the person sees. My courses, teachers, volunteers, puzzles, support, then their um, homepage. So then we also have, yeah. So we also have this, sorry. So these are like the courses. So this is like the um, course landing page where the child can access the courses. These are the courses that we have or would have, yeah. Then like most watched. So like the child's, um, the children's most watched videos or classes are here. Then we have reviews from previous users. And then we have about us. So that's all. Thank you very much for your time. Excellent. Thank you very much. So we'll hand over to the judges now. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, maybe a couple of comments and feedback from my side. Um, I think the education sector is under constant improvement and uh, this is a good idea. Uh, however, I see quite some challenges um, and maybe you can just clarify to all of us how you plan to handle these challenges. One is from competition. Um, there's so many platforms out here that uh, actually self-learning from a kid's perspective all the way to the end. Uh, some are free, some are paid. Uh, the second bit is um, you have a website. Are you looking to get into the app side of the world? Because I know from an application point of view, one can access it on a tablet, uh, much as you can access it via a browser. That might stick or rather that might get it moving uh, quite fast. Uh, my third comment or question is, uh, as you're talking to schools, are you looking to embed this into the existing curriculum or are you planning to possibly introduce a new curriculum? Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for your questions. And with the competition, as I was saying previously, unlike, um, I've seen some of the courses and what you said was very true. They have um, from basic way down to intermediate to help you finish throughout. Um, so what differs, what makes our websites different from other websites is the fact that we are employing volunteers, like they are supposed to volunteer for their website. So let's say a child is in Kenya and the child wants to use this website. We have volunteers in Kenya who would help the child if the child comes across any um, challenge because it's, because it's mainly English based and they are children. It's a, it's, there's a very high possibility. Some might not really understand the English language perfectly. 
So then the person or the volunteer in that particular country will take his or her time to explain the challenge to the child in a language more um, understanding or in a language more as like common ground to them both. Yeah. And then with the schools, um, I, I think um, would like to incorporate the website into their current curriculum because okay in my particular case like in my going to school i've, I've realized that we've been taught the same kind of ict from basic school way down to shs about the mouse microsoft word excel we've not been taught any particular thing about programming or anything of that sort so this website could really help schools like it would um, if implemented into their curriculum to gauge their ict levels up and then also enable the children to have that kind of mind or have that kind of open mind to solve problems whenever they face any of them. Thank you. Please ask well, me the question. Yes, uh, thanks uh, for the presentation, uh, Ella and team Education Tech. I think that's uh, a good, um, good area to venture into. Um, I think for me, uh, what I'll just say is, I think you put a lot of effort even in developing the, the site and catering for the various audiences, the parents, the teachers, the students, and even your niche market or target being uh, basic education starting from kindergarten where they seem to be uh, not as much content. And I can see you're also collaborating with various institutions for hardware uh, facilities for vision, especially in marginalized areas. Um, yeah, so just a comment, I think well done on that. It's a key sector that we need to work on as a continent. Uh, a comment as well would be uh, just working with the various government institutions because they are always looking for curriculum um, developers or content providers. And we are in an era whereby content providers are is one of the highly paid or most, most um, revenue, highly revenue generating industries. You're seeing people generating content on YouTube, just doing reality shows. So for you to be doing this, even in an education sector, trying to create content for our small ones, I think it's key. And you can also look at working with governments. There's, a, I forget the name of the government um, institution within, for example, Kenya where you can submit content and it's evaluated and if it is feasible, it can be added to the curriculum. So you can also explore such institutions. You can just go under the Ministry of Education and look at uh, which um, institutions are mandated to provide content, especially as we evolve to e-learning in various levels. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. I see... Uh... A very good idea, but uh, you may run into headwinds in as far as financing is concerned. Uh, because if you look at the sustainability of the project, how would you be able to scale to many schools over a period of many years to continue developing and building that content and pay the people who are responsible for building that content? So uh, yes, you may say subscription, but ultimately, uh, in my view, that may become a challenge that you need to see how you can overcome over a period of time. Okay, thank you. Um, so Ella, hopefully you were able to hear, you were able to hear that okay. Um, were there any other comments? No? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much to all of our presenters. I'm just going to go back to sharing my screen. Okay, so thank you very much to all of our um, presenters. Um, judges, thank you so much as well for um, the time and for listening in um, and providing um, feedback and questions. Um, I'm just gonna quickly um, go through again, I'll just flash up the judging criteria again. Um, everybody should have had this already, but just want to make sure that everybody sort of sees the full criteria that we have. 
um, the judges will be weighing um, the criteria against each one of, or weighing the presentations against each one of these um, criteria. They'll be looking at the technology and you know the the sort of technical perspective that you've used in tackling um, your problem, um, the design, um, the thoughts that you've put into your user experience, um, whether it was or how complete it was. So whether it works, does it achieve everything that you wanted it to achieve? Um, and then um, the rest of the assessment criteria will look through things like your presentation, um, how well organized it was, um, the problem solving, um, whether um, there was a good correlation between your problem statement and the solution, um, whether it was useful, um, whether it was built with end users in mind, how innovative, um, it is and the use of data. Okay, so just on the winners, um, as we showed at the beginning of the um, meeting, there will be three winners that will be chosen according to the majority votes of the judges. So we are going to go, we're going to a break right now and in a couple of hours, the judges will be deliberating. They'll meet up and go through um, each one of the presentations that they've seen and the demos um, and we'll decide um, who our winners are. Outside of the winners, um, please remember that everybody that participated, you know, we know that taking the time out of your day and, and coming to do this is, you know, it's also taken, you know, a lot of effort. So we want to make sure that um, you all have something as well. So everybody will have, as we mentioned earlier, um, you'll have um, Oracle credits, cloud credits, um, you'll have access to um, the Cisco Network Academy, um, and you also have um, access to um, the financial culture in your pocket. Um, so the decisions um, from the judges will be announced later this afternoon on the main stage. So the link was shared for that earlier, um, I think it was shared yesterday, we will make sure that we publish that link um, again so that you're all able to get onto the main stage um, and we'll be announcing the winners there.